One thing to make clear that came up in my discussions is that in the latent space model, those z's are something you're solving for, right? So those aren't, those, those aren't, those dimensions aren't something you give to the program. There's something the program gives back to you. And what it's doing is it's maximizing the probability of a tie in your network given the space in the, your, your position in this space. So it's, it's so if you're doing a, a you know, a two-dimensional latent space model, what it's doing is, is really saying, you know, I'm going to take the, the Moody node and the Tom node, and we're going to put us far apart if we're not friends, and we're going to put us close together if we are friends. And what it's doing in that simulation under the hood in the MCMC chain is it's trying to figure out like where the right spot is to put you in that space, right? And so, um, uh, I mean, it's, there is an MLA version as well, but the idea is trying to solve for your position in that space given the observed set of ties, right? And so, um, just to be clear, that it, it's not something you've added to the model, it's something you're getting out of the model. All right, um, so that was the, uh, a bit on uh, uh, statistical modeling. Now what we're going to do is shift gears a little bit and ask and go back to some of the substantive questions about why we do network analysis. And probably, the, the, for, especially in the health world, um, one of the key elements we care about is diffusion, right? So why do things move through a network? How do they move through the networks? How do features of the network govern the extent and, and the speed through which things move in a network? Um, this is all a diffusion process. And um, I pool together diffusion and peer influence, and you're going to see why here in a shortly, um, because I consider peer influence a type of diffusion, and it's not that I consider it, the field has, it turns out that these things are very closely related. Um, the, the distinction that people will make is between biological diffusion um, or product diffusion and peer influence, and so there, it turns out that there's some slight differences in how we think about the interpersonal process that occurs in that type of diffusion. So in a peer influence process, there's often a negotiation. I talk to you, you talk to me, and we sort of come to a conclusion somewhere. Whereas in a diffusion process, it might be that I give something to you that I already have and it spreads to the network. And so the distinction between biological diffusion and, and um, uh, a peer influence turns as much on the interpersonal process at the moment of transition as it does in the way in which the structure affects. But most of the lessons we can learn about structure, at least the big gross lessons, um, uh, are applied in both cases. Um, also, this is my chance to come in and really sort of, I promise to the first day we're going to dig into some of the Christakis and Fowler kind of ideas um, uh, and some of the critiques of those ideas um, because they're so sort of central to the field um, uh, and sort of hopefully have some ideas about where we can move forward. All right. um, as is usually the case, you know, stop me as we go along. I'm, uh, I'm in no, uh, uh, you know, I, this is, I can talk all day on this, so, um, uh, so you really got to stop me. Um, so the basic idea here um, uh, is not an unreasonable one. It's um, uh, from a network standpoint, it's you are who you associate with, right? So if you have red folks and um, yellow folks and they're connected um, uh, in a network, then over time what we'd expect is everyone gets a little more orange, right? And so um, it ought to be the case that I talk to my I red folks, talk to yellow folks, and they become a little more orange, right? And so this is the, sort of the intuitive notion is that in a line graph, that's easy to see how that would happen, that you know, each neighbor is sort of adjusting at the neighbor next to them. In the real world, of course, we don't have a line graph. We have something a little more um, uh, interesting than that. And so what I'm going to do is start with this biological model of diffusion. I'm going to start with the simplest biological models of diffusion, which are these compartmental models. Um, uh, from the compartmental models, then we're going to ask, what is the, um, uh, when, when we move away from these big buckets of people that are um, in co different compartments and actually think about network diffusion, what are the features that drive diffusion? And I'm going to break it up into two different kinds of um, features. There are topology features, that is how the shape of the network constrains diffusion, and there's timing of the network, so how the network unfolds in time constrains where things can go in the network, and that becomes crucially important, particularly for biological diffusion. I think a little, less, maybe less so for um, uh, uh, social diffusion, but I think that's a, in some ways an open question um, uh, that hopefully we can, you, know, you can solve. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about some sort of variance on these themes, and the, the, one of the nice ideas of that is this notion of complex contagion um, uh, that Damon Santola and some others come up with, and that'll then lead us directly into some of the, the models coming out of Noah Friedkin, um, uh, Tom Valente, and others thinking about peer influence, um, uh, which uh, will be the end of the day. So that's where we're going. Um, again, stop me at any point um, uh, if this doesn't make sense. Um, it's hard to start a diffusion talk in, um, in health without um, uh, Coleman, Katz, and Menzel. Um, uh, this is the classic um, uh, diffusion of an, of a, of a, of an innovation um, uh, amongst physicians. And so what Coleman did and colleagues did is they um, stratified a sample um, uh, and asked, um, what's your likelihood of adopting a medicine, a new novel medicine? I believe it was tetracycline, is that true? Yes. Um, uh, and um, they broke it up between people who received lots of ties, 
people who received sort of a modern amount of ties and people who were on the periphery of the network. And what they discovered was that the people who were really popular um, uh, sort of adopted this quickly um, uh, and then others lagged behind. And so the, the, the model they proposed under the hood for this to account for this would be a, a social diffusion model where the leaders first have it, they generate it to others, and then the people in the periphery take it up later. Um, there's been a lot of reanalysis of this data, and that finding is, you know, depending on, on which paper you read. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a, it sparked, it was, it, was, it was a nice piece in that it sparked this sort of notion, and it, it really has this interesting idea that your position in terms of core periphery or leader or follower um, uh, can generate where things go in the network. And so it's, a, it's a, a really fun classic piece to go off on that. Now this work has been taken up in the peer influence field a lot. Um, uh, so this is a nice piece by Derek Krager and Dana Haney um, uh, looking at um, the probability of binge drinking as a function of how likely your friends are to be drinking, right? And so we can think about this in terms of my likelihood of drinking as a function of my friend's likelihood of drinking, if I have an average level uh, above average level or so forth. And it's sort of a really nice way of um, this is point out that these things are all over the place. David Schaefer, who's over here in the corner, um, uh, is talking about um, the proposition that ties created or maintained over time by network process and depression level. And so this is another example of looking how um, uh, things like a network process is driving an outcome. And so this, these models get used, and this is just a sort of a quick sort of point to highlight that these models are happening everywhere. And so we have uh, lots of reasons to want to estimate these kinds of models. How do we go about doing it? Um, the simplest type of model for those coming from an epidemiology standpoint are known as compartmental models, where you break your world up into different buckets of people. And so the classic buckets of people are people who are susceptible for disease versus people who are infected for the disease. If you're susceptible, you transition at some rate to being infected, and the infected probability of contact with the susceptibles generates the ex extent to which you get new um, uh, infected, right? So this process goes through. You can exit out in various ways, right? And you might exit out in ways that come back to create you re re be de resusceptible or not, or new people might enter in in the population. What's nice about these models is you can literally write them down as probability spaces, right? So this ends up being just a transition matrix from, uh, from being in one state to the next as a function of probabilities on each of these edges. And once you have those probabilities, you can just solve for them. It's literally just a, a, a differential equation. Now you might have a very interesting set of stages, right? So this is this world's simplest model, it's susceptible and infective, but you can have different stages that you go through. So I'm susceptible, I've been exposed, and it's for a latent for a while, then I'm infectious for a while, right? So then I, then I can cause something for others, and then I move to recovered, right? And if I'm recovered, I may or may not be susceptible again, depending on the kind of disease that I have. So it's a very, so these models are very flexible if you're willing to think about people And that kind of an idea, this is my first rule to undergraduates, you're sick, stay home. <laughs> so for all of you going into the classroom, you're going to do yourself a huge favor, like, tell them to go home. Right? Um, so anyway, um, that's the only practical bit of diffusion you're going to get today. Um, uh, so, the, uh, so, so that being said, so if the, the main assumption of these models is that, is that essentially there's random mixing between each of the stages of the compartments. Right? And if that assumption is not egregiously wrong, these models work pretty well. In fact, if the assumption is wrong, but not egregiously wrong, these models often work pretty well. So you can do a pretty good job um, uh, if there's enough randomness because of the small world process, if there's enough random ties between compartments sort of internal in the set and the process moves slowly, right, these things can, can converge pretty quickly. So, so these models are really worth learning. Um, uh, they, don't, they tend to take the networks as being um, uh, pretty simple. Um, you can do fun things with them, right? So there are some states for which the recovery feature is a little different. So if you're a zombie, for example, um, uh, this is one of my most favorite papers in this line of work, is to predict the um, uh, effectiveness of a zombie apocalypse. Um, and so you can move from being susceptible to being um, turned into a zombie. The recovered effect doesn't happen much, right? You can come back to being susceptible or not. Um, but the nice thing about this paper is that it shows that um, uh, you know, zombies will, in fact, take under the world under most conditions. Um, so <laughs> it's a, uh, the quarantine does almost no good because the probability is so small. Um, uh, so people have done lots of fun things with these. 
Um, the main issue of these models, right, is that they assume a graph that looks like this. They assume a random graph and the real world usually looks more like this. Right? This is the whole point of the statistical modeling is that our worlds don't typically look like random graphs. And if the case then that um, uh, the probability of transmission is small, if it's hard to transmit a good from one set to the network, or the network is very clustered, right, then this will be a really poor representation of your um, uh, diffusion curve for that very reason that we pointed out with those random steps um, uh, in, the, in the reachability network. Well, such as this. So if it's the case then that if I start a network here, um, the way diffusion works in, the, in, this sort of simple, in this simple infection process, this, this is an SI process, is a node is infected with some probability, call it PIJ, and it ranges from really low to really high, right? The neighbors get infected. If you do, this is just one run at each step of, uh, in these pieces, and you can see that you get these different shaped curves, right? And so if I have a low probability, it never takes off anywhere. In the middle ranges, you get some growth, and if it's super high probability, you end up getting um, uh, super rapid growth. In this range, when you have very high probability, right, in this case, you've probably not um, uh, gained a whole lot by having network structure. In this range, you've also not gained much by having network structure, because nothing's happening, right? But in the middle, you probably gained a lot. And so being able to understand what regime you work in matters. Now, of course, this is a stochastic process, and so in most, the real world is not going to generate a, si a single curve, and what you're going to, oh, the real world will generate a single curve. What we're generally interested in is understanding the space for which networks move so we can compare our observed curve to some set of potential poten um, uh, uh, spreading uh, dynamics on the network. Right? So the question then is that if, um, if we've been sent, if we've been given one of these curves or some set or some, some knowledge perhaps about the transmission probability, um, what's governing the shape of this curve, right? What are the features that are making it more or less likely to be steep versus shallow? And um, as I said before, we're going to break this into two parts. We're first going to talk about how the shape of the network affects diffusion, and then we're going to talk about how timing of the network affects diffusion. Um, so the shape of the network, um, we sort of need these five features, right? So the five features are distance and reachability, um, uh, local clustering, multiple routes, and star spreaders. So reachability and distance are conditional on each other. So reachability means it's possible for me to reach you. If, if, if I'm Ted Kaczynski in my cabin in Montana, I'm not going to get the flu because I don't talk to anybody, right? And so simply not being reachable right, is, a, is a step function. But given that it's possible for me to reach you, the closer I am to you, the more likely I am to be exposed to your diseases. And so reachability on any probabilistic spread process is going to be a function of distance, or, 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 or effectiveness is going to be a function of distance. And so this is just a simple, you know, what that curve looks like, right? So given that I'm two steps away, three steps away, if the probability of transmission is 0.6, then it's just, you know, 0.6 squared, 0.36 is the likelihood that someone two steps out gets it. So this is a, a super simple sort of effect. And that curve is decreasing over time, right? Now it turns out, of course, um, uh, that local clustering is going to um, sidestep some of those features, right? And so it's, what it's going to do is that if, I, if local cluster turns this kind of spreading flow in on itself, and so in this case, person two here, this person at, at, on this two-step, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in this version, if there were no clustering, gets exposed once, but if there's clustering, this person's getting exposed twice. And so these multiple routes of clustering um, does two things sort of, it's too interesting, has two interesting effects on the spread of something in a network. On the one hand, from a global standpoint, it minimizes the number, for the same number of edges, it minimizes the number of people who get reached, right? Because all those ties get turned down on, its own, on itself. But it also reinforces the flow within that set that's reached, right? So in this world, in sort of the binary tree world, if, the, if transmission were perfect, this would be the most efficient way to infect everybody in the world, right? So if I have a computer virus, this is what I want, right? I want to make sure that I have a wonderful little Bitcoin kind of, kind of you know, destroyer virus that goes out in the world, and every time it reaches a computer, it goes to the next one and it just spreads out quickly and efficiently. There's no problem. Now, if it's a, and, and I don't have to worry about it because transmission of a computer virus is pretty high probability, right? So I don't need a lot of reinforcement. On the other hand, if I need multiple exposures of something for it to spread in the network, if I need it to reach from multiple standpoints, these kind of local loops create reinforcement. If it fails to transmit down this route, it might instead transmit down that route, right? So local clustering is a, so for the same density graph, so the same number of edges on the graph, clustering creates local pockets of reinforcement where the disease or whatever will spread quickly, um, uh, but it constrains the number of people who you reach, whereas um, uh, open broad networks reach lots of people, but it's a fragile reach, right? It needs high probability for the spread to go. 
Having multiple routes then is an extension of this idea of local clustering. So if local clustering creates reinforcements through triads, you can generalize that and think about having multiple routes in the network writ large, right? And so the, the logic here is just to expand this notion that we had before, right? So if I have transmission across a single path, I have this kind of a curve. If I just expand that out across lots of different paths and remove the, um, uh, the, the probability of, of joint paths, you get this kind of a pattern, right? So the, the notion when I double the number of paths, I get a big set, five paths and 10 paths. The likelihood of a, of a bit flowing through this network, right, increases with the number of unique paths that I have to go through. And this is just because of the probability of transmission is low, then I need multiple routes to go. Right? For those of you that remember your basic um, probability scores, right, this is the difference between an and condition and an or condition. Right, the step is an and, so I go one and, 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 and the likelihood of anything, any probability going through a long sequence of ands is really small, but if I, have a, if I can jump a path, right, then I can go for an or. And so these ors create the likelihood of reaching, so I can go down path A or path B. This is the notion that we've come up with to help capture this. Molly mentioned it yesterday, um, uh, structural cohesion helps um, uh, identify this feature. So if you think about the network topology, um, in this little example network, we have a community of people at the top, a community of people at the bottom. If I want to reach the top and the bottom, I can't do that um, uh, in this graph because there is no reachability. So reachability is zero, it's impossible to hit. On the other hand, if I then go through each of these sets, in this case, there's one single node that's a, that's a, that's a, so this network is called one connected. If I remove that node, it fits into two spa spaces. From a path standpoint, what that means is that every path that goes from the top to the bottom has to go through this node. All right, so if I knew the structure of the network at some point and I was trying to stop diffusion from going from this side to the next, I might put a quarantine on this guy right, and say, right, you don't got it yet, but you're the only route out, so we're going to make sure that nothing happens to you. Right? So if the zombies are coming and the world looks like this, get rid of this guy. Right? Um, uh, on the other hand, right, the real world rarely looks like this. You usually have multiple routes. And so what you're really dealing with usually is variance of multiple routes. So in a case where a, a network is bi-connected, no single node is going to make it possible to stop the flow. So I can go down this route or that route or some other route. But there's always at least two people that have to act in concert before the network gets split apart. Or you can have three connected. Right? And the more completely node independent routes, right, the harder it is to stop the flow of something in the network because there's all this reinforcement that happens. And what's really important, and I, and I want to emphasize this really carefully, is that it's not just the number of paths. It's the number of independent paths. For any good where actors control the flow of the good, if I decide to use a condom or not, right? if I decide to tell you the secret, if I decide to give you the, the paperback novel, right? so wherever nodes can control the flow, right? it's not just that I have a lot of paths, it's that I have node independent paths. And you can see this quite clearly. <coughs> Ooh, I'm talking too long. Um, I haven't had that happen since I was 15. All right. Um, but you can think about this. Um, if I have a hub in a network, right, that hub is going to make it possible for lots of paths to go through. So I can come through here. I can come through here. I can come through here. right? But this single node is still going to be a bottleneck. So you can have very highly dense networks. They have lots and lots and lots of edges. But if they're funneled through a small number of nodes, it's not going to be robust to spread. Right. It's going to be efficient for spread. So if it's the case that I know that this person's going to be a spreader, or if I'm doing a computer routing network, or if I'm a FedEx and I want to make sure packages go quickly, centralization is great for me. Because centralization allows me to get it to one spot and get it somewhere else without having to wander around world lost. But if what I'm trying to do is have a robust spread, if I want something to be robust to a particular node's actions, I need to make sure that there's not a single bottleneck that's going to stop the flow of something. Right. And so this is when I said the very first day, that um, preferential attachment networks are robust to random attacks, but very fragile to targeted attacks. That's what I mean. If I'm trying to, if I know my network has a very star-like structure, that tells me who I need to go through to, in order to stop the flow of a good in that network. And this was the intuition behind what were called core group models in the mid-90s for stopping STDs. The thinking was that commercial sex workers acted as this bottleneck. And if I could just go after and identify the commercial sex workers, get them to use condoms more often, get them to get tested and what have you, that would effectively be, that would be the same as removing them as being transmission hubs, and you wouldn't get the same kind of spread. It turns out that that kind of attribute-based model for what creates a hub, that is that if you're a commercial sex worker, you must be a hub, doesn't work so well. There's still a structural notion of hubs, but it turns out that it might not be the commercial sex worker, it might be one of their johns, it might be their pimp, or any other kind of role in the network. And so from a network standpoint, that intuition is right. From a labeling standpoint, the, network, the, the model wouldn't work so well. 
But the intuition is this trade-off between robustness and efficiency. Is that clear? Awesome. Here's the STD example. And so this is a, from Colorado Springs. This is the data that um, uh, John Potterett and colleagues um, collected. So we have two networks here. Um, on your left is a sexual contact network. On your right is a needle exchange network. And so what we see is that uh, the, the sexual network has um, a very um, a hub and spoke-like structure at the periphery. That is, you have commercial sex workers, they have johns, those johns have no connections with each other. And so you might think these are the nodes you want to go after, but it turns out the core of this network is reconnected um, uh, by non-commercial sex workers who are linking across them that um, uh, make it possible to have a three-connected core in this case um, uh, of the, in this entire network. So it's really easy for something to spread in this set and then get pumped out to the network. Um, but if you were just to go after the commercial sex workers, you wouldn't have a very, it wouldn't be very effective at stopping the flow. The other thing you see from this is the difference in structures, in the, the difference in social structures between a needle exchange network and a sexual network. Sexual networks are by and large one-off dyadic affairs, right? So people might have multiple partners, but you don't, it's not a group activity for the most part. Whereas needle exchanging tends to happen collectively. You do this in groups, you do it in houses and so forth, and so what you get are these really robust reconnected cliques of people who are sharing needles. And so this thing creates a structure that has lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of reconnected node independent pads. And so once the disease reaches one of these pockets, it's really easy to find its way around because there are no bottlenecks. It's very robust to spread, but it tends to be clustered. And so part of the reason why you see so much faster spread of um, STD and hepatitis STD, these types of things, in needle exchange networks is because this structure is robust to um, intervention. It's also breaking, breaking the blood barrier, right? So it ends up being a lot easier to transmit um, than it is with sex. But it's also the case that the social structure reinforces that higher transmission probability. The star spreader idea is that if you have a network that, ha this is the efficiency side, the, the sort of flip side of this efficiency, if you have um, a, a set of star spreaders, these folks can reach lots of people quickly. So having a, an unequal degree distribution, or more importantly, a disassortative network can make it possible for lots of people, for a small number of people to reach lots of people quickly. And so what you tend to have when you have a disassortative network is a rapid um, uh, sort of growth to a smaller number of people versus a slower growth to a larger number of people in terms of this spread of a good for any given set. So if we wanted to put these things in a horse race and say we have these different kinds of features that might matter for diffusion, you know, in a, in a set of realistically observed graphs, what happens? Well, um, we, Ashton Berdery and I simulated this in a, in a project we did a while ago where we took the Ad Health Networks just as, a, as an example of real world networks um, and asked, let's imagine you know, that we were to simulate a diffusion curve on this network, um, can, or diff diffusion process, how much is the diffusion being governed by connectivity, by star spreaders, or what have you? Um, the problem with that, of course, is we need, a, we need a comparative metrics, and so we observe a bunch of diffusion curves in a school. How do we know if that's a, a, a fast spreading school or a slow spreading school? What we do is we compare it to the random network, right? So for any given network, we have a curve defined by a, a, a random network with that same degree distribution. We have an observed spreading um, in, that, in, that, in that network. And the distance between those two, um, uh, those two curves um, is the, essentially the amount, of, uh, the amount of, how the amount of clustering and redundancy in the network um, uh, is affecting spread or retarding spread relative to a random graph. Remember, random graphs are almost always going to be your fastest spreading networks. Um, uh, so these curves are almost always under. There's a rare case where it's, a, where it's above. Um, but in real world networks, they tend to be below. Please. How do you separate Yeah, that's the beauty of doing a simulation here. I fixed this. I fixed the probability of spread. In the real world, you, that's, it's really difficult to do. Um, uh, so in the real world, both of those things are going to be moving simultaneously. In biology, for biologically spreading goods, we tend to have some, you usually have pretty good biology on that spreading parameters. We know given con contact between a singly infected person and a, uh, a susceptible person of a particular type, say sex or needle exchange or whatever, we, we have some pretty good biology on the, the transmission rates. For social goods, not at all, right? So if I have a, a really sort of sexy tweet that is going to have a high probability of spread, it might go everywhere. Or it might be that I have a really boring pictures of my dog, but I'm a really star spreader, right? So being able to distinguish those two is hard. Um, and and that's, that's it's something of an open question. The, the best we can do in an observational study of something moving through is compare on the same network different types of goods to try to identify what types of goods are more or less, more 
fast or slow spreading giving that set. But you're absolutely right. These things, in the real world, all of these things are moving simultaneously. In this little um, simulation exercise, the world's easier because I can fix the transmission probability, hold it constant, and just let it run. Please. Yeah, so from the, so the point was that they, there are these two competing ideas that you have that if you have social support, you end up being healthier. We have no observation in the network that people who have lots of social support end up being healthier than people who don't. But if you have lots of social support, you're probably exposed to more people who have disease. Is that? Yeah, yeah. and there are studies that if you expose people to have social support, they don't get it. Ah. And so so it, there, there might be a, a countervailing feature on the biology that if you have lots of social support, the transmissibility of the disease drops, right? That's a great point. I'm, I'm doing nothing with that here. Um, uh, I would love to see more of that work done. And so the, the way the, the hypothesis then would be that if there have, um, uh, that essentially the, the, transmi the, the PIJ, the transmissibility across the edge, is a function of the cyclic structure, the local cyclic structure, say, of the network. You could model that, um, uh, and we could see the extent to which that's, um, that has an effect or not. Um, part of, the, of this exercise is to do this teasing out, saying, all right, so if I, ho if, I, if I live in a fake world where I can hold the transmission constant, I don't have these biological feedback processes, I just focus on the structure, what kinds of structural effects are more dominant in the spread of, the, of, of something through the network? And so what we were able to do here was show that um, the, uh, the closeness in the network always has a, a, a relatively, um, so this is, so this, uh, uh, how do I say it? So this is um, the observed or the random should be, yeah, so let's make sure this is going the right way. So, the, so if your network is, is, is very distant, right, so if you're spreading far away, then the likelihood of having a, a, a transmission path um, is low, so it ends up being that the diffusion risk in the setting is always governed by distance in the graph. That tends to be the dominant effect in a network, but it's counterbalanced by this OR condition, right? So the more independent paths you have in the network, the less distance matters. Um, so that, and in this particular simulation, I don't know, I think, I think in the slides you have the actual regression tables, um, uh, but it ends up being the case the clustering doesn't matter that much. It has the effect we expect um, uh, in terms of it dampens overall spread, um, but net of overall cohesion and um, uh, distance, which seems to be the driving factors here. All right. I gave you these graphs a bit ago. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out about this robustness idea is that a little bit of random noise can create a lot of robust action in a network. So this is a, the, the four graphs right at the edge of the phase transition for what we call a low degree network. No one in the network has more than three ties. But if you shift from a very low degree network, about 1.7 on average, to about 1.8, you move from a network that's completely disconnected to a network that has a very strong reconnected core. So a very small amount of random noise can create um, a, a lot of redundancy in the network. And so this is what that little core network looks like. Um, and if we imagine the entire space of places where um, uh, networks can um, uh, be spread, it looks something like this that in these low degree networks, you not only have a, a phase transition right here, you have a very sharp phase transition, right? So it moves from being nobody connected to almost everybody connected over a very narrow range of the um, degree distribution window. Whereas if I have a long tail distribution, you still get a phase transition, right? So if, if there are a few people in the network that have a lot high degree, but it's a much smoother set, right? So from a public health standpoint, this world is a, really a kind of a dangerous world, right? So I mean, it's, it's great if you know what side you're on, then you can, then you're fine. But if you're near this, anywhere near this transition set, very small changes can create a rapid shift from one regime to the other. Whereas if you're in the um, scale-free world, if you're in a world where the network has a very long tail, you tend to have a little more room to play, right? So the network, I mean, so the, the, you're not gonna move from one set to the next dramatically different. All right, I'm going to skip this part just in the interest of time. Um, we go through and what we discover in this um, uh, little simulation exercise is that um, the shape of that degree distribution, the amount of skew in that overall network, so if you have a very narrow degree distribution, so a few people have lots of, um, a small number of ties, or a really long tail distribution, and all the places in between. What's interesting about this network is that um, it ends up being the case that respecting a volume, if you're cutting off the tail, if you're getting rid of that long tail, you're actually making the network risk worse. 
This is kind of interesting from an STD standpoint because so much of the energy, um, uh, in, at least in the late 90s and early 2010s, was focused on commercial sex workers, um, right, which is effectively pushing um, uh, uh, the degree tail down. And so if you're not simultaneously moving to the left, if you're not simultaneously lowering the average degree or the average volume in the network but just changing the shape of the distribution, you're actually making your, your, your problem worse. So this is just a cautionary tale to say that if you're going to intervene on networks to, in order to stop um, uh, diffusion processes, you want to spend a little bit of time thinking about how those interventions are going to affect the topology because the topology governs the flow of things in the network, holding everything else constant. All right. All right. So that was a quick hit on the main features of the, how the shape of a network affects, you know, the way things are reconnected affects spread. Questions, comments on that before we move to the timing and dynamics? All right. So the timing of context matters on top of all of this. No, none of this is going away. So all the shape stuff matters, but in addition to that, we need to think about how edges are timed. Um, and we do that, um, I like to think about three separate networks that are actually engaged whenever you observe a network in reality. So you have the contact network, that's a set of people who are linked to each other. Then you have an exposure network. This is the subset of these for whom the timing of relations makes it possible that one person could reach the other. Right? And then from that, a subset of that are the people for which the transmission actually occurred. Right? And to make that really clear, imagine you have a, a little toy network like this. Right? And for the convenience, I've said that edges happen at distinct time points. So this happens at time two, this happens at time three, this happens at time one. And the basic rule for spread on a network that's dynamic is that you can't move backwards in time. Right? So if I have the bit at, good at time one, I can spread it to my future partners, but I can't spread it to my, fast, my past partners. The joke is that my past partners are irrelevant except for heartbreak. Right? So it says, it says my, my partners, my future partners only matter Right, in terms that they break my heart, it's not that they're not going to give me a disease. Right? Um, and so I need to think about my partner's past partners in terms of a risk. And so we can th imagine that there's a flow from person A to other people. Right? So for person A, is, of course, can reach, can reach the people they're directly connected to. So A can reach D, C, and, and B. And then at time two, I reach B. So later at time five, I could reach, I could reach J. But uh, if this happens at time two, I can't then reach L through that path. Ah, but I can through that path and that path. So it turns out there's a three-step path to L, but the shortest path through L doesn't exist, right? And so the exposure network is defined as the subset of edges for which the unfolding in time makes it possible that if A were to spread something, it could reach them, right? Now that is um, uh, then from this egocentric standpoint, from where A is standing, there's a set of people that they could reach, right? Then there's a probability piece layered over that. And so that's the actual transmission graph. It's going to be the subset of those edges that get activated given any kind of um, uh, uh, probabilistic process on the network. And so this is um, a way of thinking again about this notion that Martina Morris came up with um, uh, called concurrency. And so in concurrency, the idea is that uh, the two edges are adjacent. Uh, 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 the, the intuition is that edges are, that a concurrent relationship, uh, uh, someone's involved in concurrency if they have two partners at the same time or multiple partners at the same time. So concurrency from a simple standpoint is just that edges overlap in time. Um, from a technical standpoint, what you're really interested in is whether or not the starting time of the second edge is less than or equal to the ending time of the first edge. And that is if they overlap in time. And it turns out there are a couple ways of thinking about this. Um, and so if I imagine that the edge from A to B goes from time one to time three, from B to C goes from time two to time eight, then C to E and so forth. So this is just a, a little phase diagram or space diagram of the, um, uh, of the timing of the edges on this network. We find that the concurrent edges are where they overlap in time, right? So in this case, B the AB relation and the BC relation overlap between times two and three, right? And so they're concurrent for that set. And then the extent of concurrency, the measurement we use, might be something like the proportion of edges that have any concurrency at all, so we could double it, or we could say the amount of edge length in time that is overlapping time. So there's ways we can, we can operationalize this um, uh, that are more or less um, uh, exact, but the point, the, the idea is that we create this window where they overlap in time. Now, why do we care about that? We care about that because when edges are not overlapping in time, right, they create this bottleneck feature um, when you bump into it, an edge that's already ended. So in this case, this relationship happens from time one to two. Right? In those cases, this type of test, this happen, so these ones happen early, this one happens later. At that point, A can reach B and then later reach C. 
But because this relationship is done, C can't reach D, right? So anytime you have non-concurrent concurrent relations, if you, keep go, you go long enough down a path, you're going to end up sort of running out of edges unfolding in time. You're going to end up with this type of bottleneck. But when you have concurrency, what happens is that same contact structure where um, A can only reach C through B in time becomes bidirected, right? So now it's not just the case that A can reach C, but now C can also reach A. And so every time you have a, bi a, a concurrent edge, you create what would have originally been a single path down the time temporal ordering, like that same contact pattern now generates a bifurcation. It makes it possible now that, it, the, that the disease flows not just down the right-hand side, but also down the left-hand side, right? So okay, it's not just that it goes this direction, but it could also go that direction. So what you've effectively done every time you have concurrency is you've vastly expanded the number of exposure edges in the graph, right? So you've created this possibility to have much greater sort of reach in the network than you would if the exact same contact pattern were limited in time. To make that point really clear, imagine I have the exact same contact graph where all the edges are, are concurrent. So I put the real observed edges in red, and the implied exposure edges in black, right? So in this case, everything's concurrent. It's possible for each person to reach every other person. I can reach you clockwise, or I can reach you counterclockwise, right? Now I take this exact same graph, right, same contact patterns, all the, all the contact graph is exactly the same, but I unfold it in time. This relationship happens first, second, third, fourth, and so forth. In this case, then, we now have essentially an upper triangular network where person one can reach everyone else, and person eight can only reach the person they're directly connected to, right? And you can imagine going through this network and identifying the spaces, right, slightly different changes in the temporal ordering creates a very different reachability in the overall network. So this network can reach from a, from a circle graph, in this case, could reach everyone, so connectivity is perfect, to only a little less than half, depending only on the timing of the network, right? Now this isn't a deep intuitive idea, right? This is exactly what your mother told you about your past partner's partners. But mathematically and um, from structurally, it has a, some really interesting features in for what it does to the graph. And one of the nice things that I like to think about is that it um, uh, creates um, uh, this, it sort of plays with our notions of shortest paths, right? So we're used to thinking about network statistics and graph paths and so forth by doing something like a breadth for its search. So I would say I start with person A, I want to know if I can reach person E. It turns out that I'm one step from somebody I'm two steps from somebody who's one step from me, so I should be three steps from them, right? So I should be one, two, three steps. But this path, it turns out, is not available to me to reach E because this relationship ends, af ends before this relationship begins. And so even though the relationship here is two steps and that relationship is one step, the relationship between these folks is four, right? So it screws with our transitivity of paths, right? So this idea that you can just add path links together in order to get a um, uh, reachability in a network doesn't work out as well as it used to, especially among the collection of people you're connected to. So the distance structure in the network changes, right? Um, uh, as does um, uh, a series of other um, yeah, a series of other features. It might be that we really don't care so much about the um, shortest path. We might care about the first path, right, the fastest path. And so these, once you start thinking about these temporal dynam dynamics, there are lots of different ways you can play with this network. The other thing you want to think about is that concurrency is effective not so much as an individual risk set. As a person, as the person I am, and with my risk of being a disease, I've still had sex with the same number of partners. It doesn't really affect my risk much at all. What it does is it affects the flow of edges that go through me and how that affects the population. So it really is a population risk effect because it changes the set of exposure paths available in the network, not an individual risk effect. And so to make this point clear, you can imagine a network like this, hey Jeff, where every tie, every tie happens you know, at the same time, right? so the contact pattern is exactly the same, but now I'm going to say all these networks happen at the same time, and then all these edges happen at the same time. So locally, my, only one person has sort of like changed their behavior and sort of relative to their neighbors, um, but it radically shifts the likelihood that the population gets reached, right? And so this entire set now um, is at risk from the first set, but they're not risky to the first set, right? So the unfolding of edges in time can create these entire paths of the network that are unreachable from others, even though it doesn't change the individual risk set. And this has really been a, a bugaboo in the public health literature because people do something that on the face of it seems obvious. What I would do is I'll go to a country, Right, I'll do a random sample of people. I'll say, are your relationships concurrent or not? And then I'll um, uh, correlate whether or not they have a disease with having concurrent partners. And the correlation is pretty low. 
right? So my own concurrency doesn't have a, it's, it's generally positive, but it's not very high. But at the country level, if I look across countries, in countries that have high concurrency, they tend to have higher HIV epidemics than countries that don't, and that's because of this population effect. So even though it's not affecting the individual, it's affecting the population. As a sociologist, we love this, right? This is, this is a real sui generis sort of social fact feature, right, of the world, where something I do, um, uh, sort of some pattern of behavior has a collective effect Right, without necessarily having an individual risk effect. And I think that's kind of a cool feature that you get because of the interdependence of networks. Um, all right. This is an, uh, a graph I showed you the other day. Now you can make sense of it a bit. Um, uh, we did a simulation based on, the, uh, uh, on some real data. I don't remember what the underlying real data was at, at this point. Um, I think it was ad health data um, that, and the sexual relationships in ad health, but I, don't quote me on that now. Um, the main piece that we did in this, in this network is we were able to vary the amount of concurrency um, and then ask what happens um, for the spread of uh, disease in the network. In this case, um, this is, uh, we had started with 10 random seeds in the simulation. We then go through and see where does the disease fall. Most of the edges are not concurrent, right? So the blue edges are not concurrent, but all these trees have some concurrent edges in them. And in fact, if you were to look at these edges and say which ones are downstream from a concurrent tie, it turns out that almost all of them are ultimately, especially in this larger connected component, are ultimately concurrent. Now I remember this paper, sorry, I'm starting to blank. And the other thing that's going on in this case is there's a race mixing difference. And part of what's happening is that in the, 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 the individual levels of currency, concurrency between blacks and whites are not that different, and they're almost exactly the same, in fact. But what's different is that blacks tend, there tends to be racial homophily with respect to um, uh, 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 sexual partnerships, and what that creates then is um, because minorities in any min min minority majority group where you have a small number of, of minorities but, but a strong in-group tie, you're going to get more redundant cycles, right, because the density of that graph is going to be higher. So by, fe by pure feature of the relative sizes of the groups, again, even though the, the actual individual behaviors don't differ, you create more redundant paths within the African-American set than you do in the white set, and those tend to be overlap with each other in time because they're also locally clustered, and you get this higher spread of HIV, or, or, or the higher spread of disease. And so it's a really, again, one of these nice features that is a community level effect, even when the individual level effect is not different. Right, so individuals are behaving a lot, but because of the mixing structure of the population, you get a different outcome. All right, um, one more bit on this timing effect that I think is kind of fun. Um, when does timing matter? Um, uh, we might like to be able to make some sense of um, how timing, can, so if timing constrains the potential diffusion paths in a network, we'd like to know whether or not it's possible um, uh, to um, figure out when that matters a lot and when it doesn't matter a lot. And so um, one way to think about that is that if we're increasing the number of exposure paths, what we're effectively doing is creating lots of um, these robust channels that a disease can flow through. And so what we'd like to be able to know is whether or not um, uh, that timing matters. And so what we do is we contrast settings where we have um, very redundant tie patterns versus those that we don't have redundant tie patterns. And we do that with the structural cohesion idea. And so here in this network, we can ask how many independent paths are there between each pair of nodes in the network. So these nodes that are one connected are going to be one connected to everyone else, but you get little pockets of two connection. And so the average in this overall network is about 1.2. You contrast that with something like this, where we have a little pocket here of three, and then a bigger bi-connected component, and only a few people who are one connected. The average connectivity in this network is about 1.6. That's our independent variable. So we have some settings where we have high connectivity, and other settings where we have low connectivity. And then we're going to change the amount of concurrency in the network, right? And we're going to ask um, uh, how much concurrency we observe. Um, uh, we're going to manipulate that via simulation. And then ask, essentially, does concurrency matter more in these really sparse networks or in these really dense networks? Hypothesis? What do you think? Yeah, I'll have the slides in front of you. But is concurrency going to matter more in networks that are um, sparse or networks that are dense? Dense, we have one vote for dense. Hands for dense. All right, hands for sparse. All right, this is what I like, way to go. So this is what the curves look like. Um, uh, this is the amount of concurrency in the network. 
And this is the returns to um, uh, concurrency in terms of the proportion of people ultimately infected with the infection. And what you see is that um, density matters, but not because of concurrency, right? Dense networks should get spread, but there's almost no return to concurrency because you've already tapped out, effectively. Whereas where concurrency really matters is in these sparse networks, because those networks would otherwise get broken, right? So in a sparse network, right, the only reason you get um, any transmission, let's go here, the only reason you get any transmission across these sets, right, that's a fragile link. But if it's concurrent, then I can reach it from this side, I can get it from that side. Right? And so this, the, the concurrency has a higher rate of return, a higher marginal effectiveness in settings where you don't have a lot of concurrency because it's what it's with concurrency or where you don't have a lot of redundancy because what concurrency is doing is creating temporal redundancy where structural redundancy wasn't already there. If you already have lots of structural redundancy, right, if it's the case that your networks are already um, uh, highly cohesive, why do I not have that slide there anyway? In this set where you have very highly cohesive networks, the timing doesn't matter so much because there's already structurally an alternative route through the network, right? And so we did, we went to hell with the joke, simulated a giant enormous net of networks, and this is what these curves look like across the entire set. And so it's a nice way of thinking about what kinds of settings is concurrency gonna matter in. It's gonna matter in settings where you don't already have a robust structure. The timing can then act as the robust insurance underneath of the spread of the network. All right. Um, how many do you want at a time? All right. All right, so these are the, the structural and timing moderator effects, right? So concurrency has a necessary positive effect on potential diffusion. Structural cohesion captures these multiple routes and so then provides this um, negative interaction between the two because cohesion acts as concurrency, it creates these alternative routes that you can move through. All right, one more bit on um, uh, actual diffusion processes and then we're gonna move on to the peer influence side. So on the diffusion side, um, what we've been talking about thus far is just edgewise diffusion. If I'm if a susceptible, it's connected to an infected, um, uh, then there's some probability on the edge. You flip a coin at that probability, it gets passed or not. Damon Santola and, and um, uh, Matt Sogana came up with this idea a few years ago of this thing called complex contagion. And, the thing, and this is really important for um, social diffusion. The idea is that I hear something from one person, it might intrigue me, but I need to hear it from someone else before it takes. Right? So someone told you, hey, you know, networks are a good idea. I'm, uh, you think, ah, maybe, it's possible. I'll go check this out. I come into a room with a lot of other people talking about networks, and then you go, yes, I bought the Kool-Aid, and off you go, right? So, um, but the notion is that social things tend not to be like biological things. It's not an edge-independent process. It's often the case that I hear something from lots of different people, and that reinforces the idea in my head, and that, reduct and that reinforcement creates a new um, uh, diffusion process. And so this is um, the basic idea is that if I assume that adoption requires K neighbors for having adopted, then transmission can only occur within dense clusters, right? So it's impossible um, uh, in, if, 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 you know, if, if two of these people start with the goods, then this person can get it, then this person can get it, and maybe then this person can get it. You have to have multiple people around you in order for the, for the infection to go. And if you have these little bits of pieces in the network where it's hard to cross those bridges, if you don't have structural um, uh, closure at the local level, complex diffusion can almost never spread. So this is a nice, and the reason this is interesting, I think, from us socially, is that it helps explain um, a mystery in the diffusion process, is that most of these kind of, you'll notice that almost all the diffusion curves I've showed up tapped out ultimately at the population, whereas in the real world, lots of diffusion never gets off very far, right? It usually peaks, dies out, and never goes anywhere. Well, complex diffusion provides a natural structural answer for why that's the case. Right? It's hard for complex diffusion to move across these bridging edges into new communities because you rarely have two independent feeds into that community. And so for complex diffusion, you're much more likely to get spread um, uh, that looks something like this. Right? That most of the time, the diffusion goes almost nowhere, but only in very rare settings does it go anywhere. And if it does, right, it's, it sort of goes out to everywhere. You get none of this middle range. Right? So the kind of places where it can go everywhere or when you, for, you hit that magical combination of a sequence of pairs of nodes or triples of nodes that have it, that can spread from multiple directions and cross those bridges that are otherwise really hard to set, but the vast majority of the diffusion features fail. Right? So complex diffusion is one answer to the mystery of why diffusion doesn't always happen everywhere. Right? It's because you need this kind of reinforcement, and because there's some clustering in network but not uniform clustering, right, it's very hard for complex diffusion to pass over bridges. And we do more work, I'm uh, talking about how that happens and we're gonna go through here. All right, so, um, 
skip that one. All right, all right, all right. All right, so now what I want to do is move on to some peer influence questions. Before I get there, more questions on the generalized diffusion ideas, please. Are you going to talk about general models for diffusion? Um, uh, yes, we're going to get to, um, uh, we're going to talk about models that have their, their peer influence Friedman kind of models here next. Please. So I'm not an interventionist, but I'm wondering if um, you have, you know sort of where there's concurrency in the network, where there are um, overlapping in time, ties that overlap in time, if that's actually something you can leverage in terms of an intervention, that those are the places where you might want to administer some kind of, like if these are the people who have overlapping relationships in time, and maybe that's, those are the people that target for an educational or condom. Or right. Yeah, so typically the, the um, it's very difficult to know who's engaged in concurrent relations prospectively, right? So I can't, so the, I, you give me your history of past relations, I can say this is what the network looked like, and I can use that to explain why concurrency is bigger in one spot than the next. But what we do know is that some different types of settings are, have more or higher likelihood of having concurrent relations. And so what we can do is intervene on the likelihood of concurrency moving forward. And so most of the interventions that have to do with timing are um, sort of no grazing policies. They say, look, it's, it's, you can have as many partners as you want, but one at a time, right? And so you know, it's, in, in a lot of these contexts where, where, where concurrency seems to be driving epidemics, men will have you know, a spouse and a partner on the side, right? And if you say, like, just don't do that, right? It's the partner on the side that's causing the thing. Like, stop with one before you start with another. Right? This kind of a process can create a, 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 as a huge prophylactic effect um, uh, in terms of helping prevent the concurrency effect. So what you're trying to do is pick your battles, right? So if I'm in a setting where I think concurrency is going to have a high effectiveness, then I, want, then I want to focus on lowering the amount of concurrency. Now, concurrency, um, uh, the effectiveness of concurrency, I, I haven't simulated this, but my intuition is it's going to have the same kind of phase transition as a lot of these other features. That there's probably relatively high th um, uh, sort of moments um, uh, in the distribution of the amount of concurrency in a network, below which you're not going to get anything, right? So you might not, it's not that you have to eliminate it, you have to get, just get it below that level to create the redundancy that's just driving the outcome. Um, and that would be fun to see. Good question. All right. So, there's a lot, so the peer influence dynamic field um, is the behavioral side of diffusion. And the, thing, the, the idea here is, is that I'm not just spreading a bit to you that you then take up and run with, but instead we're engaged in some kind of interactive process where my discussing with you affects my behavior um, and that affects your behavior and so forth. So um, the, there are lots of ways to do this. Most often we assume the mechanism that people have some, um, we change their, their behaviors um, uh, uh, through some kind of a communicative model. Right, it's not necessary that it's a communication model. It could be a modeling feature. It could be that you, know, you see me, I'm uh, drinking scotch and decide that you know, I'm not going to drink what that old guy does, give me a bourbon, right? And so um, uh, you might figure out that there's, so there might be other sort of models other than us uh, sitting down and having a nice deliberative model. Um, academics, um, uh, historically, perhaps because we are academics, have favored deliberative discussion, sort of averaging models, um, uh, but you don't have to have that as the mechanism, but a lot of these features work on the, on the set. So we could be modeling, it could be distinction, and so forth. Each of these different kinds of alternatives are going to create a way of um, operationalizing the diffusion equations that we're going to talk about in ways that are um, a little bit different. So you might not be an average of my alters, it might be you know, one of my alters is all I need, or it might be a negative sign or something. Um, but it helps you think about what those ideas are. Um, most of the work early um, uh, in diffusion and these kind of peer influence models um, uh, were ego network um, models, um, uh, and they were ego network models informed by the respondent. So what we would do is we'd go out and survey some kids. We'd say, do you smoke? And we'd say, do your friends smoke? And they'd say, yes, all my friends smoke. And it turned out that um, there was a high association between what kids did and what kids reported their peers did. And about half of that association was because kids overestimate the similarity of their networks. And so we all think our networks are more homophilous than they actually are, right? And so I'm convinced that all of my, um, uh, you know, people that I talk to voted the way I did, except for my family. Um, uh, and you know, so it's like, you know, I can, I know that, right? Because I, because I'm sure that they're, but there's, there's probably some, you know, closet Democrats that I'm not paying attention to. Flipped you, didn't I? You weren't expecting that. Um, 
No, so they, but they, they, it's really easy to overestimate that everyone in the world is like you, and people do that for their networks as well. All right? And so when, once you take into account self-reports of behavior, the association between ego's behavior and alter's behavior dropped by about half. Um, then there was, it tends to be a cross-sectional associational bias. So a lot of the early studies were cross-sectional. We'd do one set. We'd say, you're smoking now. Your friends are smoking now. Um, and we estimate the effectiveness of peer influence and say that there's a pretty strong association between these two. Um, and it turns out that at least some of that association is because of selection, right? It's not that you caused me to smoke. It's that I needed to smoke a cigarette, so I went and one from you and we became friends, right? And so once you tease all these things out, sort of the, there's been a, a steady like, chipping away at some of the effectiveness of peer influence um, once you move through some of these really high overestimates to some of the more dynamic models. Um, and so this is, uh, this, I want to put that in context of where some of these ideas are coming from. All right. The best way to get at um, uh, these kinds of uh, peer influence effects are going to be experimental methods. And Sheree Hassan is going to, I don't see him here yet, he's going to give us a, a discussion of experimental methods this afternoon. But essentially the idea is there, if you, can, um, uh, if you can experimentally manipulate who people are in contact with or what they have to spread through the network, you can then get a really good association that distinguishes between the selection influence, it's dynamic, it's not, it's not, not self-reported, and so forth. It's really hard to do that, right? So experiments are hard to do. There are a handful, there are a handful of, of settings where it does occur. My favorites are dorm random assignments, and Duke now is going to random assignment of, of students to, um, uh, 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 to their dorms. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to get those data. Um, uh, but there we have it. Um, I, I pity the RAs. It makes, it makes the life a little more easy, hard there, but so we have it. So the foundational model for these kinds of, of, of features is, is um, uh, from Noah Friedkin. Um, uh, uh, and the, and the basic, and there's a great book called The Structural Theory of Social Influence. And the model is really of two parts. There's an individual characteristic model, right? So I have a behavior um, uh, that is a function of being a man or a white or being um, uh, educated or not. And then there's an interpersonal influence fo fo function. And the model looks basically like this. This is the way part that motivates it. So I have some vector of behaviors um, or attitudes at time one. And that's a function of who I am, right? So I come into the world thinking a certain thing or come into the setting thinking a certain thing because of who I am and my background. And then over time, right, I have some function of my prior behaviors or t minus one, which is a trade-off of balancing between this interpersonal influence matrix so the people I talk to and my own beliefs, right, at time one. So this is just my beliefs at time one. And so if you tune this alpha parameter, right, so if alpha parameter goes to zero, this drops out this thing just becomes that, opinions don't change. So in a world where there is no peer influence, right, when this goes away, we just have a standard regression model. On the other hand, if we were to flip it around entirely and make um, uh, this thing go to zero, so there's a perfect peer influence, then where I start doesn't matter, we're all going to converge onto wherever the population goes. So that's how this model is, is set up. Um, and it's a pretty classic, um, uh, stand, straightforward model. Notice that what it's doing at any given point in time is it's just taking um, each of my alters' behaviors and it's averaging over them. So I'm taking, so my feature at time i, um, uh, my individual outcome, is just the um, coefficient of the behavior of my alters across all the alters I'm connected to. And so this, in this original formulation, this is really um, uh, just a, a, very, uh, a very simple averaging model. The theory here is one of communicative discourse. All right? I sit down. Um, uh, I talk to people I disagree with, we come to a nice um, uh, compromise, and that attitude then moves forward, right? That's how my life works, um, uh, that every Thanksgiving works out that way, um, uh, uh, exactly like that. Um, but it's a, it's, it really is a good place to start. I mean, you might, you might think it's silly when you start, but it's a really nice idea for thinking about behaviors, especially, I think, for adolescents or, or young people or new people coming to a setting where they don't already have super strongly uh, preformed ideas. A couple of constraints to make this model work. Um, uh, the weight, um, uh, the value of the weight has to be between 0 and 1, and it has to sum to 1. And the reason for this is that if it's not, what you're doing at each stage, at each time step, right, is you're multiplying um, uh, w times the outcome. If it were greater than 1, then y would just explode, right? So it would go off the charts. And so what these constraints do is they, um, they're sort of, uh, they're, they're um, you know, volume constraints. They make sure, they make sure that, the, that y doesn't explode off in the population to something that it doesn't otherwise exist. Um, so then you want to think about what is W, right? So what is this interpersonal influence matrix? Um, you can think about it um, as, a, as, um, a, it, as, as essentially an opportunity to build in your theory here, right? So if I have a way of thinking about a, a peer network structure, 
I can do the simplest non-stupid thing and just say that everybody is equally weighted. Here I've given self weights. I'm not sure why, because uh, I could put that somewhere else. But in this case, I've given myself self weights, and I'm just saying that everybody is equal. Right? Um, uh, and in that case, that would be this, uh, a very simple um, uh, average of opinions belief. On the other hand, I could say that I'm going to believe I'm going to have a stickiness to opinions, so I'm holding my self weight really high and a little bit lower and so forth, right? And so this, from a, from a generative standpoint, you could say, I'm going to, I'm going to I expect in the population for there to be a weighting of one type or another. Um, now, once you run this model a little bit, right, and you let the model go over and over and over again, it, one of the nice things about it is that it converges on a stable form when you make these assumptions, right? So when you don't let y discern, when you make the contact matrix static, right, what's going to happen if you let this go to infinity is you're going to converge on some equilibrium rate. And that's really nice, right? The nice thing about the equilibrium is if you're willing to assume an equilibrium, that means your cross-sectional estimates, right, of these coefficients are going to be pretty consistent. Now, the main assumption for this, or at least from that I've, that I, 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 you know, maybe others will disagree, but my own intuition is the main assumption of this that we violate is that W actually changes a lot more quickly than we give it credit for, right? So this selection process of trying to adjudicate between friends who are like me or not, Right, means that our underlying network is not as stable as we'd like to think it is. If our network is really stable, then this coming to equilibrium is really not a problem and probably happens pretty quickly. Um, this is just to point out what this thing looks like. For those of you that are um, uh, like just chomping at the bit, um, uh, this looks a lot like a spatial autocorrelation model because it is a spatial autocorrelation model. Right? It just turns out that instead of having a, um, uh, a road map distance matrix, right, something that is a, a planar network, our distance now um, uh, in space is in social space as opposed to geographic space. And so, we're gonna say, so what we're going to put under the hood is not an adjacency uh, sharing a county boundary or a, a road intersection. We're going to put in are your friends or not. All right. All right. So we, because it's a, whoa. All right. Didn't realize I'd lost that. Um, yeah, I guess you can still hear me OK? I'm a, I'm, I'm a little loud and boisterous. I can't help myself. Um, so the way this model works, just to sort of walk it through your head, at each time step, people might have different beliefs. Then you go through this process over time with a high peer influence effect. You're going to converge on a set of opinions. And I have a series of slides here that talk through this, um, uh, but it's sort of easier to see it in a little, little quick little sort of silly simulation. Imagine I have a network of three groups, right? So I have red, green, and, and blue people, red, green, and yellow people. I mean, it's a pretty clustered network. And I randomly assign them to two opinions. Right? Like literally randomly. So I've given you a random X, a random Y, but then I have you talk to your friends. And so what happens if you talk to your friends, right, is you start to adopt their belief and you converge on ideas. And that's really all this model is doing. So as it's going through, it's thinking about what am I doing. Now if I have um, a much higher weight on my in-group in ties, right, I might end up with a much stronger differences in opinion. Right? Now this actually leads us to some fun things we can think about. Right? So imagine I have um, a, a, a process where I want to generate um, a different kinds of mixing. And so I might have a population with a minority and a, and a majority, say a heterodox or an orthodox opinion. And I want to figure out what happens to, a, to the opinion structure of the population if the heterodox folks are sort of by themselves, they don't mix with anyone else, if they mix a little bit, or if they mix a lot. Right? And so if you think about a world where we have you know, very little mixing, where the heterodox folks are off in the world and by themselves, right, it looks like this sort of visually. This is what the moderate one looks like. This is what the deep one looks like. Um, you can think about how these ideas work. And if there's not any much mixing, right, you end up like that. Right? And this is what social segregation does for us. Right? And so if you wonder why fraternities, sororities, cults, everyone else sort of um, finds themselves on their own spot and sort of it restricts mixing with everyone else, is that it makes it impossible for, that, for those ideas to get watered down. Right? So the reason that I want to keep in-group homogamy in my setting is I want to make sure that I, by remaining distinct from them, right, I don't affect I, I, my, I, my own internal cohesion doesn't get destroyed. On the other hand, if we have a fair amount of mixing, right, you can see that the beliefs and opinions start to come, not so much in the moderate mixing, um, but in the heavy mixing, right, so you still end up seeing a fair amount of internal connectivity, right, so the, the, it's not that the cults aren't thinking about each other, but their ideas are becoming subsumed under this space of everyone else. Now this is again just a model, at this point it's a model to think with, it's not a model to estimate, right? So we're just sort of using this as a way to think about the processes that are there. So let's think about some different processes, right? So we might imagine a world, right, um, uh, where people have um, role positions that require the, their 
belief in something, right? So if I'm leader of the Democratic Party, I have a set of ideas I have to adhere to. That's my job, right? I'm not going to do something else. And so I'm not, so as an individual in this case, then what I'm doing is that I'm now saying that interpersonal influence can vary across people, right? So instead of having a single coefficient, I now have a vector, right, of, inter, of susceptibility to influence. And if I'm the leader of the Democratic Party, my susceptibility is zero. <laughs> I don't change my position, I just put out talking points, right? And if you do that, what happens then, of course, is that the population gets pulled around those leaders. And so the population structures of beliefs starts being pulled off, here's the ones that I've fixed, right? It's the, the more closely tied you are to that setting, the more likely you are to maintain in that piece. Right? And so this is how belief structures end up getting twisted based on um, uh, people having to, to not, to the extent to which they don't engage in this kind of um, de, you know, assumed deliberative process. Um, now in turn, what we, what we can't do unfortunately in this model, um, you know, uh, this is easy to do in simulation, if I want to estimate this, I, I now have too many parameters, right? So I, I, can't, I can't have a, 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 a new parameter for every person in this set. Um, though there are ways that we can get, um, we can approximate it to let essentially random effects of peer influence. All right, um, where are we at now? Um, did I skip a slide here? Yeah. So the, again, as a model to think with, what's nice about this model is you can think of lots of different ways in which we can constrain either the influence structure the network structure or the, um, uh, 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 or the interactions between behaviors and, and, and effectiveness and so forth, right? So all of these are ways that if I want to take this basic peer influence model and extend it to other ways of creating influence, I might do it by saying that a person's behavior um, interacts with the kind of people they are. So men and women have different susceptibility to influence, say, blacks and whites, Republicans, Democrats, what have you. That's an interaction effect in the spatial autocorrelation model. It might be that there's a, um, a difference in the multiplexity of my um, connectivity network that changes the weightingness, right? And so complex contagion says that I only have influence across people where I have a closed triad, right? And so that means the weight matrix, all of those ties where I don't have a closed triad effectively go to zero, right? So you can think about ways of restructuring or reweighting this based on a new theory. It might be, again, if what I'm doing is reacting against other folks, the more of my peers to do something, the less likely I am to do it. Right, that creates a dynamic alpha, right? So that alpha, instead of, instead of being a fixed feature, it has a T subscript that is conditional on the, on the rest of people in the outset. So again, as a way of thinking, estimation is an entire another set, but as a way of thinking, you can sort of uh, imagine lots of different ways in which this world is organized. All right. So how do you estimate this model? Um, uh, so this, the model as specified is known as the, this is just a, a, a net, known as a network autocorrelation model. It's a spatial regression model. We can write down a likelihood function for it if we're willing to make some assumptions about the error term. Um, uh, in R, this is known as the linear network autocorrelation model. Um, and Y is usually continuous. And you literally estimate it just like this thing looks like. I have a vector um, uh, of behaviors that are covariates. I have an adjacency matrix as part of my, uh, my network. I've normalized that one way or another, and I can put it in this model. In the cross section, it's very easy to estimate. Um, uh, it, you can write down the likelihood function. It's just like, this is this is well worn, easy to do stuff. Um, the um, uh, the uh, standard errors in this are approximate. Um, uh, <laughs> There's a fun little paper that came out um, uh, in the early '80s by Pat Dorian, where he did a lot of work on um, uh, sort of you know estimating these models in various and different ways and came up with what he calls the QAD estimate, which is the quick and dirty estimate. <laughs> so as if you just do it for whatever you have. Um, uh, and it turns out, yeah, it's not that wrong. Um, it's, you know, you do fine. Um, uh, when I need to estimate these models, I tend to use um, R, the R package, the linear network autocorrelation model, the LNAM model that Carter Butts put together. It's a really nice um, uh, model for doing this. And one thing that I like about it a lot is that it allows you to actually have two separate um, uh, parameters here for a peer influence effect. So you can have a direct effect, that is the, which is the, the, the causal estimate you're trying to estimate here, which is the association between your peer's behavior and your own behavior. But you can also have an error component that's related to the network. And so you can parse out the extent to which my error is associated with the people I'm hanging out with versus whether or not the influence is associated with the people I'm hanging out with. And so it's a nice way to parse out both of those. Um, and it works, it's a very fast model. I mean, it's a very, it's a very nice piece of software that he's corrected for us. The other thing that we do, um, a lot is non-parametric effects, right? So you can estimate these models using QAP either direct at levels, right, or um, as by converting it to a dyad model. So that is what we were doing before when we were saying, let's take a distance between two people. That really is, we just take the distance in your vector space here, we treat that distance then as the, on the dyad as a thing we're modeling. That then becomes 
a dyadic score. So the difference between I and J on some outcome is a function of their distance in the adjacency space, or their being present or not, and their difference in their behaviors, right? And so this model is exactly the QAP model we described before. The disadvantage of doing this kind of model is that it's um, often a little bit harder to interpret similarity as opposed to level. So if you're trying to explain an outcome to a population and you say that people that are tied tend to be more similar than people that are not tied, that's different than saying that you know, the peer effect increases you know, the probability by X percent or something, right? So the translation to practice ends up being a little more difficult. That then raises the question of like, what do we do when we do want to estimate these models? And so how many people have read this paper or know this paper? All right, so this is the spread of obesity um, uh, in a large social network over 32 years. That, I, mean, I think part of the, um, uh, yeah, so this, this, this paper is, I love this paper, I'll be honest with you. I think it was, it's a great paper. Um, it's, um, it's great um, uh, in both what it did Right, and what it did wrong. And <laughs> so what's great about this paper um, is that it sparked, like, I love the effect of this paper. Um, and, I think that, and I think that most of what they did was reasonable um, and understandable, um, uh, even though it could have been improved on. But it's, it's a brilliant paper from teaching a peer influence side of things in the sense that it raises a bunch of questions for us um, uh, and I think actually um, proposes some answers. And so just for those of you that haven't seen it, um, uh, the uh, Framingham Heart Study was a, a big, prospective study over many years, 32 years in this case, where they were bringing in people around Framingham and asking them um, uh, you know, lots of health questions. And it was never intended to be a social network survey, never. But what happened was, whenever you do a big study like this where you know you're gonna follow people for many years, is you ask lots of questions, like if we can't find you, right, who do we contact? So, or if um, you get sick when we're doing your, your, your cardiogram, who do we call in case of emergencies, right? Those are name generators, right? And so many, many of these studies have implicitly built into them name generators um, because you want to follow people up and contact them. And so that was a brilliant insight um, uh, that they had in sort of saying, you know what, there's really network data in here. Moreover, because Framingham is a relatively small place, lots of people in the study are also in the study with other people they're connected to. Right? So you end up with this global network, um, uh, uh, well, is partial global network, um, uh, because of pure happenstance that it's a small place and a high density sampling, and we know the, the set of people in the network um, uh, who you're gonna make contact with. So this is the largest connected component, and because it's over time, they're able to follow folks over time. Um, green nodes are not clinically obese. The size of the node um, uh, is proportional to their BMI, and what happens over time is people get older, they exercise less, and they end up getting a little heavier. Um, and so by, the by 2000, you see a bunch of folks sort of pass the threshold to obese. Um, and you also see these little clusters here where people who are obese tend to be next to people who are, and people who are not tend to be next to people who are not. And so if you then break this out on the network, just observationally, um, the, the association between um, uh, your um, uh, weight and your BMI and your, um, or your obesity status, excuse me, and your direct contact neighbors, people that are two step away, three step away, and four step away, it turns out the people with one and two steps of you, you're much more likely to be similar to them than you would be than um, uh, expected um, otherwise, right? So I tend, people tend to be similar in terms of the BMI across all the different examinations than the people that they um, are directly associated, more so than the people they are in the network as a whole. That's great, that's a nice association. It doesn't mean your friends make you fat, right? Um, as, the, as, the, as the joke of this paper became to be seen. And so what instead what we'd like to do is we'd like to model this association in some way that we can tease that out a little bit. Um, and so there are a couple things that um, they did. The way they ended up estimating this model, there are two types of models in the paper. The first one is, a, uh, is what I refer to as an edgewise regression. We take ego's current weight, and it's a function of alter's current weight, plus alter's previous weight, plus ego's previous weight, plus a bunch of controls, right? So this is a relatively straightforward um, uh, prediction of a level. Um, uh, this is the effect of uh, uh, ED alter's current weight um, by alter's type. So we have friends, we have spouses, we have siblings. And one of the things that's kind of fun about this is that mutual friends um, uh, tend to have a very high effect. People I perceive to be my friends um, uh, have a significant effect. Whereas those who perceive me to be a friend but I didn't reciprocate to have no effect on me, right? So part of the argument that they're making in telling this story is that I'm more influenced by people I recognize than by people who recognize me that I don't. That's not an unreasonable thing to say, right? And so on its face, that seems to be a pretty reasonable thing to do. Um, if you ask yourself, well, what is this model really doing? And why are people starting to get upset? And we're gonna walk our way into it. 
Um, this is what the models were, would, would look like from a scatter plot standpoint if you're just looking at two cases, right? So in this case, persons, um, uh, uh, we have an orange person and a blue person. Um, uh, person one um, uh, has, you know, at, or sorry, the orange person was observed at time one, at time two, at time three, right? And because I might have three friends, like my weight stays the same at each observation because I'm just a single person, but my author's weights are going to vary. And so this effect is really fitting a curve to this piece. Right? And so we have a lot of repeated observations. We have things like that. So we're gonna, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to cluster. We're going to do some of those tricks that Brio was telling about the other day in terms of multi-level modeling. We're going to want to account for the fact that these people they have the same ego observation with lots of different alters. And so we're going to do some clustering by um, uh, some what are known as random effects models, um, controlling for the fact that the same person is re has repeated observations. And you do all that kind of stuff to correct for that. Now alternatively, if you do, so once you do that, right, so I have what's known as a random slopes model. So in this case, I fit one line for the blue person, another person for the, for, the, for the orange person, and we can allow that slope to differ from persons. We can also do an over time change model, right? So this is the level version of that model. There's another version of this model where I say the change in my, uh, my weight is a function of the change in my alter's weight, right? So all these models, um, these first difference models have been done and so forth, and all of them show much, much the same kind of effect, which is that there is this general tendency for the coefficients to be positive, right, to be on this side of the line as opposed to that side of the line, and be highly associated with the, um, uh, with the uh, substantive strength of the relationship. So family ties, mutual friendships, and so forth tend to be much stronger than um, uh, you know, things that are neighbors or opposite sex friends or alter perceived friends. Now, from a general like peer influence standpoint, when, the, when this paper first came out, I was like, eh, that's kind of nice, not a big deal. Cool, on to the next. Um, uh, my science news feed, it was not that big a deal. Then it just exploded. <laughs> and it exploded, the economist got a hold of this um, and said, there is no way in hell this is true, <laughs> right? And the reason is it's all selection, right? Um, uh, that people are selecting into the friends, the models are run poorly, they're, de they're not properly identified. And the reason that this is the, the, the complaint that folks have had about over this is that the models can't possibly assess a causal effect of people's friendship, um, uh, association of, of my peers' behavior on mine. <laughs> now, and we're going to um, we're going to talk through what those critiques look like in a second. I wanted to sort of just preview this idea. Part of the com complaint here is a um, is a technical complaint, right? It's not. No one's already arguing that it's an unreasonable social theory to say that you end up taking on the weight characteristics of the people you have lunch with every day, right? And so the fact that we're all sitting in this room about to have a nice heavy lunch, right, it's probably an it probably affects the likelihood, right, that we're all going to get weight, you know, gain weight together, right? Um, uh, that's our one benefit to this, uh, to this process. So from a social process standpoint, I don't think any of the people who critique this model are going to say that this is an unreasonable thing. Just like when you, when they, all the findings out there that show the spouses make you healthier, right, anybody who's ever had their spouse tell them to go to the doctor, know that being married helps, right? Especially for men, because men would rather not go to the doctor, but their wives make you go anyway, right? So, there's no, so it's, it's not that it's an unreasonable thing as a social theory. It's a difficult thing to do as a statistical problem. And so, that's, so just to be really clear, the main issue going on here is that it's not clear that these methods can distinguish the effect from the social effect that any ethnographer would tell you is happening anyway, right? So what are the critiques of these models? So all of them turn on some version of what I would refer to as a model specification problem. So first, you can't distinguish a selection effect from an influence effect or a common influence effect. And the best version of this model, or the best version of this critique, that is the most rigorous sort of damning version of this critique, comes from Shalizi, um, uh, Cosmo Shalizi, in a paper where he shows, from using graphical model techniques, that peer influence models are generally confounded. That is, um, outside of a very strong set of assumptions, it's always possible that there's some pre-bit, um, uh, some omitted variable that's causing the association of us being friends and our behaviors that we've left out of the model, right? And in a peer influence model, that's all, it's always possible it's the case, and it's, you know, it's a backdoor threat to causal inference, that it's possible that there's an alternative path through the selection window that it, it obviates the unique effect we've been able to identify of cause of the friendship association on the outcome. I'm going to show you that model in a second. The other sort of type of critiques are statistical uh, errors. Right, so these are that um, the, in the paper there was some kind of a, um, a an error, in, an overinterpretation, an overexuberance um, uh, to uh, uh, estimate these models. Um, 
So some of the critiques of this model are that people have um, looked at different ways of estimating this exact same form of a model on things that causally are very unlikely to have a peer influence effect, right? And so this is a paper um, uh, that Cohen and Cole put out, Cohen and Jason Fletcher, saying that my skin's, my, my friend's acne um, predicts my acne, or um, uh, my friend's um, a headache predicts my headache. And the argument here is that there's no causal association, there's no reason to suspect that my friend's acne affects my acne. I'm actually not true that one's true, right? Um, if you've ever hung out with you know, adolescent boys playing video games in their basement all day, I mean, I think hygiene is probably contagious. But, um, uh, but that being said, right, it seems like it's, an, uh, it's a less likely effect. I mean, headaches are really hard to come up with a social mechanism where your, you know, your, your headache is causing my headache unless I have to hear about it continuously, right? So, so, we're, so this is the, so the, the, the logic of this critique is that if we can find these associations where there is none, where we know there probably is none, then these models are probably suspect, that there's something about these models that might be overestimating the effectiveness. Now one thing to keep in mind here is that this, this is the, the, these effects are only significant at the point one level, and they're substantively very small, and if you throw anything else with the model, they go away. Right? So this is a, it's a true effect. But this is a pretty under, these are, these are uh, true critiques on a pretty underspecified model. So that, for, from my standpoint, it doesn't hold a whole lot of weight. Um, the other critique is that they're misinterpreting their coefficients. And this is a classic mistake that people make, and, 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 they're, and they're right, which is that it's one thing to say that a coefficient is different from zero. It's another thing entirely to say that a coefficient is different from each other. And so part of the claim that, uh, that Christakis and Fowler have made is this distinction between my mutual friends versus my best friend versus my all to perceived friends. And it turns out that some of these effects are different from zero, but they're not different from each other. So here we see that the confidence interval of one overlaps the confidence interval of the other. And if you actually do the edgewise comparison test of one effect versus the other, they're not statistically different. Um, so it's the case then that we can't distinguish one from the other. And so making this is so saying that there's a lot of weight you're going to put on one of these or the other is probably hard to do. And that's, that's not untrue. Um, and so I think that the solution to that is you need to be a little bit more cautious in how you interpret these effects, right? This is always true, um, and it's a general trap that people fall into, so you want to be a little careful of that. Um, there's a bunch of other things that go through in this model. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, uh, uh, just because they're here and you can read them. Um, there's a great uh, set of papers, and they're linked in the, uh, 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 in the slide deck to take you through the debate where, where um, Chris Dawkins and Fowler go through each of these um, pieces and see uh, uh, you know, each of these critiques and talk about them carefully. Um, the general critique um, uh, is this, um, uh, uh, for peer influence models is this idea that if we really, really care about observing is the causal effect of my friend's behavior on my behavior um, uh, or um, uh, my, uh, us being friends on my behavior. Um, the risk here is that there's some out thing uh, something we've not observed, this is what the latent circle as opposed to the observed is, so un some unobserved variable is causing both our behaviors and our being friends, which then works out to us um, uh, having an effect. So we can't say there's an independent effect of our being friends on our behavior if there's a joint feature that's causing both of them. Right? So this is a classic omitted variable problem. And there are multiple ways that this can happen. So it could be that um, uh, X causes Z but not Y directly, or it be, could be that this um, thing, um, uh, X causes Z, which then in turn causes the adjacency, um, but again, not Y directly. And so the idea is that there are these alternative routes that are there. Now this is fundamentally a specification problem. And if you take this paper really seriously, you can flip it around and you can say that in the absence of um, having an adjacency matrix in my model, right, without knowing the peer effect that's, that's, that's adding to the causal variance here, that the effect of these others are also sort of contaminated, right? And so if you really take this paper seriously, there's almost no observational um, uh, design that can give you a causal influence. So you've got to be really careful about how much you want to take this, because this, this model throws out the baby with the bathwater pretty quickly. So you want to be very careful about what you're doing so that you're not, so you're trying to be, um, uh, uh, what's the phrase, um, you know, cognizant of real risks to inference without being over um, uh, uh, cautious for making any progress at all. That is, we need to be beware of making the best the enemy the good enough, lest we make no progress at all. And so I think there are, so how, so as a practical matter, how do you solve these problems? I think there are a couple things we do. Um, the strongest possible correction is to use what are known as fixed effects models to control for all non-varying covariates over time. Right? So this is if you have nice dynamic data, I can actually say that like, whatever feature is selecting you into the model, that selection feature is probably stable enough that if I am able to have a fixed effects for you as an actor, 
right, and still find an adjacency feature in, then all of those backdoor causal issues are probably soaked up into the set. Now, rigorous causal modelers will say that's not sufficient because there might be a time, uh, a time varying feature to your behavior that I've not captured that's not soaked up in that set. So it's always possible it's there, but that gets rid of a lot of, at least of anything that it's um, uh, non-time bearing. Um, or you can model both of these processes simultaneously. To my mind, this is probably the, this is often difficult to do and I think is often overcorrection um, uh, because you're, you're, you're also taking away any feedback process of the network onto the person's aspect over long periods of time. That is, if that equilibrium model is working at all, this is gonna overcorrect for your effect. Um, these two-stage models work nicely. Um, uh, they're a little hard to fit um, uh, and experiments work even best. But honestly, um, uh, the, um, uh, the two approaches that have been, uh, the, the alternative approach to this that's been proposed is to use what are called instrumental variables. And so the idea for an instrumental variable is that if what I really want to do is estimate the causal effect between some variable, it doesn't really matter what it is, and why, if that thing's generally confounded with something else, right, that whatever's going on in here is going to be difficult for me to, um, uh, to find an estimate of. And so what you would like to do is identify some instrument Right, which in no way overlaps with the things causing your causal threat and use that instrument to predict the association on the set. The problem is almost invariably whatever instrument you find is gonna have low power, right? Because of the way it's been constructed. The whole, the, what you're doing is there's only a little bit of variance you have already to predict why, to create to, to, you know, a little bit of inform unique information to predict the outcome. Now I'm throwing away the majority of that information and finding something that's correlated with that bit of information, but not what I care about in order to have an instrument. Now sometimes you get an instrument that works really, really well and it's just brilliant and it's a really wonderful design. There's a wonderful paper that just came out by um, uh, Aral that looks at the effect of Fitbit friends on your um, uh, running behavior. And because people can be distant in geographic effects and things affect my friend's running behavior that don't affect my running behavior, I can identify an, uh, that as an instrument. That is, I can use thunderstorms on my, in the area of, the, of, my, of my Fitbit friends as an instrument for their running or not, as opposed to whether they really run or not. And that instrument then is correlated with their actual behavior without being correlated with mine because weather is an exogenous and random effect. And they find a very nice pure effect out of that set. So, so every once in a while, you'll get a good instrument. Random assignment is a great instrument, right? So if I can put you in one room or neck, that works out really well. Though as, as Shariq will say, it's not always um, uh, 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 the right thing to have. So what else do you do instead? Um, I think the best solution, if you can't do one of these two steps models, is to actually think carefully about what the actual threat to validity is. And we do this with sensitivity analysis. And there's a couple of really nice papers um, uh, that are doing these. Um, uh, where you ask yourself, given that what I know about the structure of the covariance in the population that I'm playing with, right, how big a threat is it realistically that there's some other variable that I've missed in the model, some selection feature, some kind of thing that's going to create a threat to inference, right? And the way you do that um, are, with the, are by estimating how big the omitted variable would have to be in order, and how correlated it would have to be to anything else to create a threat to inference. And so what you're saying is that you're not ignoring, it's, it's not a zero one. You're not saying that there is no threat to inference in my setting. It's saying that given this, the strength of association I'm seeing in this world, if there's a threat to inference, it has to be really big or really small. And if I'm in a world where small changes to my model are gonna affect my inference, then I wanna be really cautious about making that claim. Right? I don't wanna say that there's a pure effect here if it can go away with the, additive, with the addition of a very small number of variables that have very low correlation with anything else. But if it takes a really big admitted variable, right, that has to be highly correlated with anything else before my effect goes away, then I may have overestimated my effect, right? The point estimate is probably too big. There might be some things out there that I forgot but it's unlikely to invalidate the association entirely. And in the world that we've been playing with, most of social sciences where we have, you know, the, the real distinction is positive versus zero as opposed to big versus small, that's probably fine, right? And so I would love to see these kinds of sensitivity analyses um, made de rigueur, like that everyone just does them to say, right, if, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make a claim to a peer effect, I wanna know how stable that peer effect is in the face of possible threats to inference. And the good news is that's really easy to do. There's now, Ken Frank has a whole series of, of tools that allow you to do this for lots of different types of models, linear models, nonlinear models. He has, if you want to do it as an Excel sheet, you can do it there. If you want to do it as an R package, if you want to do it as a Stata package, right, it's all there. You can put it in. And what they allow you to do is to say that, um, uh, I don't know, do I have that piece here? You know, what they allow you to do in these models is you can say, you know, they allow you to estimate the number of people in your, the proportion of your sample for which the effect would have to be zero, right? 
for your, for your observed effect to go away. And this is sort of an intent to treat versus a take up um, kind of model. That what we're estimating in the regression is an intent to treat effect. We treat it as if everyone got the treatment. But what this model lets you to do is to say, well, let's imagine that only you know, X percent of our people took up the treatment. Right? It, this will tell you that how many of those people would have to be truly zero to have no effectiveness um, for this model to be um, obviated. And so it's a very nice, simple way to do it that in the face of in a world where we can't randomly assign people to friends as much as I would like to with sort of you know, giving you colored badges and such, um, uh, you know, as much as I would want to randomly assign people to friends, we can't do that. Instead, what we need to do is live in a world where we have observational data and take that data and do the best estimates we can. If you can come up with a great instrument, knock yourself out, do it. Don't substitute a bad instrument for no instrument at all because a bad instrument is worse than no instrument at all, frankly. Um, uh, and instead, always check the sensitivity of your models um, because at the end of the day, that's what we're worried about anyway. I have some more stuff in the slide deck about um, uh, experiments and such. I'm going to leave that aside um, because um, Sharif's going to talk about those anyway. Um, the beauty is, is that in the online world we're dealing with now, there are lots of opportunities for doing experimental things in networks um, that never used to exist. Um, uh, and there's now also easier software to do that. So if you want to do an experiment, that's the easiest way to get at this model. All right, so I'm going to stop there, take some questions, and then we can go to lunch. Questions, comments, thoughts? I shouldn't have mentioned lunch if I really wanted to have <laughs> All right, thanks, folks.